So there are different conditions under which demons are, are granted access to oppress us. Um, they don't have free reign in this world. They don't have free reign in our lives. Otherwise, we'd all be dead. Yeah, exactly. and, everyone who's an, and everyone who's an unbeliever would have been killed before they had a chance to yeah. repent and believe. So if he had free reign, we wouldn't be able to have this kind of conversation right now. Yeah. But if I go and sacrifice a chicken in my backyard to Molech, <laughs> will Satan have some more uh, leeway in my life than right now? Yeah, absolutely. Why? Because sin is one of the conditions under which God will re- relax his leash of restraint over the powers of darkness in our direction because we've invited them into our into our life, yeah. into um, you know our home, if we're talking about objects in a home, by virtue of the fact that we're participating in sin, transgressing the commandments of God, and the commandments of God are meant to keep us under the protective covering of the Father. So you see in Scripture instances where, you know, it will say things like, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Give the devil give a no foot. Don't give the devil a foothold or an opportunity. So you see unforgiveness gives Satan an opportunity, a place, a region, a district, in the Greek, the word's top house there, where he didn't have that before because sin's present, right? You see, resist the devil or submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Turn you to Which means if you aren't submitting to God and you aren't resisting the devil, he won't flee from Amen. you, right? You see the breastplate of righteousness, right? If you're not walking in righteousness, your breastplate, your spiritual armor is disabled. Yep. Right? Okay. So righteousness is how you protect yourself against the attacks of the enemy. You know, it's not magical spells or incantations or special formulas. Righteousness is a major weapon of our warfare. And so when it comes to legal ground, I'm not saying that sin is the only condition under which God would permit a demon to attack someone. Perhaps perhaps God would say, you know what, this person, I want to elevate this person. I want to test their faith. Mm. So I'm going to allow a demon to you know, give them a nightmare or attack them or something because I want them to draw closer to me. Yeah, like Paul's an example thorn in the would flesh. be Paul's, like Paul's thorn, thorn in the flesh. Yeah. Yeah. Keep him from so exalting not, himself because of the incredible revelation. Right. right. So God's not causing the satanic activity, yeah. but he's permitting it well, to yeah. occur for his purposes, but he's not the effectual cause Amen. of it. Satan had a very clear example of this. Um, well, first of all, you do see in the scripture there's really four categories of God's exercising of his sovereignty over the powers of darkness, one would be God does not permit Satan and demons to do certain things, right? So when you see the the demons, for example, they're crying out in the streets, I know who you are, the Holy One of God, and he did not permit them to speak, right? Or when he binds Satan for a thousand years, he's restricting, he's not allowing Satan to do something. But then you see instances like in Job, for example, where he's allowed to do some things, but not anything he wants, exactly. right? Destroy all he, has, all he has, but stretch not your hand against him, right? So God allows satanic activity, but restricts it. That's the second court category. And the third one would be he just allows it altogether. He allows demons to, you know, do what they want to do. For example, in Luke chapter 8, when the legion gets cast out of the man, and they, he says, don't send us into the abyss where the fallen angels are chained and awaiting their final judgment, according to Jude, Second Peter and the Book of Enoch, you know, permit us to go into the pigs. So we can maintain in Satan. We can maintain um, existence in Satan's air kingdom and not get cast down to the abyss, which isn't hell, awaiting our final judgment in the lake of fire. And it says Jesus gave them permission. Yep. And then so what happened? They ran off permission. a cliff, though. That God let him run off a cliff, right? And that's where we get exactly. the first instance of deviled ham. That's funny. <laughs> So, but that's interesting because what, what the Bible teaches us is that um, everything is ruled over by God. God is totally sovereign over everything. It doesn't mean he's causing everything, but everything that comes into being, that comes to pass supernaturally or naturally must first pass through the siphon of God's permissive will. Yeah. God has to allow or permit something. So the question then becomes, under what conditions will, will God allow Satan or demons to attack or oppress the life or the living environment of a Christian. And one of the crystal clear examples given in Scripture is the sin of idolatry. Sin in general, which we've covered verses about sin in general, but the sin of idolatry is the most demon-infested sin in all of Scripture. It's spoken more than any other sin in Scripture. And there's a very interesting passage here, and I'll turn back over to you guys, I'm kind of ranting, but 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 20 to 22, um, Paul says this, he says, I imply what pagans offer unto idols, they offer unto demons. 
you can't sit at the table of the Lord and the table of demons. You can't drink up the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. Are we going to provoke the Lord to jealousy? Mm -hmm. So what Paul is doing there is he's saying, you are participating with demons by partaking in pagan temple ceremony, yeah. right? That's causing you to participate with demons. Now, Corinth, what they were doing at that time was in pagan temples, they would go and they would have an altar set up for, for the god, whoever it would have been, Athena or Zeus, who knows they would have been worshiping, Prometheus, whatever. And then you would have food set around the altar as an offering to the god. And then you would have Christians coming around and sitting out, sitting down and fellowship and eating food off of the table, off of the altar that was meant to go to act as worship unto these pagan deities. Mm -hmm. And in the Old Testament, the Old Testament sacrifice system, you would have the priests eat from the offering off of the altar mm. unto Yahweh. And the eating off of the temple altar was meant to be an act of participation. It was part of the, the worship and the reverence and the sacrifice that was given to Yahweh. So Paul's saying, you guys aren't realizing this. You're not going in with conscious intent, and you're not, you're not motivated. You know, you don't wake up one day and say, I'm going to go participate with demons today. I'm going to start worshiping demons and participating with demons by eating off of the table of pagan deities. But he was saying, this has gone farther than you realize. And even though your motive and your intention isn't there, that's not a necessary condition for demonic interference. This idolatry is. Yeah. You can be thinking something else. Your motive can be somewhere else. You might have a clear conscience. You might not have evil intent. And the idolatry itself might not be or look very evil. Yeah. But you're participating with demons, and then he says, are we going to provoke the Lord yeah. to jealousy? Look at places like Leviticus 17.7 in the Old Testament. Um, there's another verse in Deuteronomy and in the Psalms where it tells us that when the nation of Israel went apostate and started sacrificing unto foreign gods, unto other, you know, Elohim that they had not known, it says that they were sacrificing unto demons. You know, Leviticus 17.7 says specifically they were sacrificing their children unto go demons. And so you have this relationship, Old and New Testament, where behind the idol and behind the practice of idolatry, there are demonic powers, yeah. right? And by tacitly complying with the sin of idolatry, you're inviting participation with those spiritual powers. That's what Paul's telling the church in Corinth. Right? Your, your, your motive's not there. You're not consciously worshiping them, but you're tacitly complying and tacitly involved Giving place in idolatry. Right? And so the question is, and, and if you look at Second Temple literature as well, like First Enoch and Baruch and stuff, and even the early church, Justin Martyr and Tertullian and all these guys, they understood that idolatry was demon-centric. Yeah. It was always revolving around demons. So then, as this relates to occult objects, we would have to understand Things like, I don't know, a mask that we got from our trip to Mexico or Peru that we think looks really cool, or some statue or trinket of some little funny-looking man that we got when we were in the Caribbean, that what these objects really meant, uh, what they really represent, even Hinduism, Buddha, Buddha heads in our garden, what they really act as are interfaces between the natural world and the spiritual world. Right? The, these are meant to be the contact point between Satan's air kingdom, Ephesians 2 2, and the natural realm. Yeah. How does he gain access to poke through the supernatural realm into our natural realm and influence the natural realm with his, with his power, with his energies, with his presence? It's through the medium of sin. And these, are, these objects, these statues, these tools of sorcery that the average American household is decked out yeah. in. In my opinion. Like, you know, people have Buddha for decoration just because they think oh, of yeah. Jade Buddha it looks cool, you know? Yep. Right. And so they were meant to be um, a medium. And they acted as sort of like a medium between the, the pagan and the deity itself. And if you look at certain cultures as well, like ancient Babylon, like ancient Egypt, like ancient India and, and Native American spirituality, they didn't just believe that these objects represented deities in the spirit world who we would understand to be demons. These are demons that they represent. They, they understood the deity itself to come and live in inside and inhabit the object. So they believed that the God would live in the object, yeah. and the God would travel where the object would travel. Mm. And, you know, some of these cultures, they would believe that the, the deity, what they would do is they would fashion the deity, make it out of stone, make it out of wood, whatever. They would wash it with holy water. They would sing an incantation 
to the deity to try and get him to come and live inside the object. And then they would normally put different substances in the statue's mouth to try and feed the statue, to feed the god, so that the statue would be enlivened. Mm. These were called enlivening rituals, and wow. in ancient Babylon it was called the Mizpi ritual. And then they would believe, okay, now Tammuz is in the, in the idol now. And wherever the st statue goes, Tammuz is going. And you see this leak through in the biblical text in different places where, um, I, I can't remember, I think it's in Second Samuel, where when the object is d destroyed, the idolater says, you have destroyed my God. Mm. Right? And there's this identification happening between the object itself and the deity in the spirit world. We would understand to be demons. Now, in and of itself, it's just wood, it's just stone, all of this stuff. But can there be a demonic, a demonic power attached to the object by virtue of the fact that we're offering it blood, by virtue of the fact that it represents a demon, by virtue of the fact that it refers to a, a power in the spirit world? Right? And then the question is this, if I'm bringing these things into my home, these things that the Bible calls images of jealousy yeah. in Ezekiel 8, verse 3, because they provoke the Lord to jealousy, you know, is God under any obligation to protect me against reaping the spiritual consequences of decking my house out with tools of sorcery and demon gods, images of demon gods? Right? Does not the Bible say he's not a respecter of persons and whoever sows to the flesh will reap from the flesh dis destruction, yep. right? Does, does not Galatians 5 list idolatry as a work of the flesh, right? The images themselves, the objects themselves, at least two dozen times in Scripture are banned. Not just the worshiping of them. That's different. That's the first commandment. So what would you say to that person, as you've heard this many times, well, I have the Buddha, but that means nothing to me. It's just decoration. Can you kind of unpack how just because you don't believe in it, because right, we have, we talked about early off camera how you have to have faith, but a demon doesn't need you to believe in it, especially if there's an object dedicated to the demonic, right? You, they prayed for that that spirit to be on it, what Jay would say God, but really it's a demonic spirit. There's only one God. So tell, unpack that where someone says, oh, I just have like for us, I don't know if you've heard of Kachina dolls, the Indian Kachina dolls, a lot of people have that on their walls and they just say, oh, I just, you know, I just like it. It's really pretty. It's kind of Indian art for Arizona, but that has a, that's a God. That's a, yeah. that's a, that's a false deity. So what do you say to someone like that? who just says, okay, Steven, I hear you, but I don't, I'm not a pagan. I'm not a new ager. I just like artwork and I'm just really hip, you know? Well, I would say what, what they're essentially saying translated would be, I hear what you're saying, but I don't want to obey God. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's true. Right. So having these images in your house, it goes against the second commandment. Right? Oh, no God knowledge. says, you shall not make any graven image or God of cast iron nope. for I am a jealous God. And Deuteronomy chapter 7, I would refer them to Deuteronomy chapter 7, where God puts a ban on occult objects and pagan statues. When he says, when you go in to dispossess these people, um, I believe it was the Jebusites, I don't know if the Canaanites were one of them, it was the Jebusites, the Amorites was another group. He's like, you're going to go in them, you're going to destroy everything. Everything. Everything is devoted to destruction. Oh. The word used in Hebrew is harem, H-E-R-E-M, and it meant complete and total annihilation of everything. So they would, basically, what was supposed to happen in Deuteronomy chapter 7 was the nations were devoted to destruction, and the objects that they possessed, idols, pagan statues, these were also devoted to destruction. In the King James Bible, in the New King James, the word for devoted to destruction, which is harem in Hebrew, is actually accursed. Mm. And he says this, you need to destroy these things because they are, are accursed things and do not bring them into your midst, lest you become an accursed thing like it. Yeah. So what he's saying is that these things are banned, devoted to destruction, and if you bring them into your midst when I tell you not to, since, the, since my condemnation and judgment are on those objects, when you bring them into your midst, that condemnation judgment is going to pass on to you. Yeah. And you see in Joshua chapter 7, King Achan disobeyed this, and he brought some of these statues into his midst. And I forget what, which, uh, it might have been Joshua. He woke him up in the middle of the sleep, of his sleep, the Lord did, and says, there's objects over there. You're not going to win the battle if you go to war. Mm, yeah. King Achan disobeyed this. Okay. You need to go 
wake him up and tell him you have objects in your mitt that you stole from these pagan nations. And he ended up getting stoned to death, yeah. him and I believe it was his whole family. Yeah. Very graphic scene. People need to go read Joshua yeah. chapter 7. Now, later on in the Bible, it was supposed to be capital punishment. Having these devoted objects in your house, these false gods, false idols, tools of sorcery, in the Torah, in the Pentateuch, death was the proper penalty. And it wasn't just death. Prior to death, God would cut you off from the people. You would basically be rendered dead to him before you were dead. You were cut off from the covenant promises. And you should, if you want to read the, the penalty for idolatry in Scripture, I forget the direct passages, there's some of the most severe graphic yeah. descriptions of penal justice we have in all the Bible are against the objects. What happens when you bring the objects into your midst, right? And so later on in Scripture, they would cause people who wanted to worship these false deities to be outside of the city, right, outside of the walls and often to represent death, to represent separation from the people of God and the covenant of God. But now these same objects that God used to put the death penalty on, that he calls accursed, that he calls devoted to destruction, or like, no, I want them on my wall, I want them on my bookshelf, I want them in my garden. They represent demons. Yep. If, if, not, if they don't represent demons, they're tools used to contact demons. Mm -hmm. Right? Or they're, at the very least, they're part of demonic spirituality. Yeah. Here's a question. If the Lord presses on you and your conscience, you need to tell that person something. Yeah. Right? You need to give them a loving rebuke, a loving correction. He brings something to mind, he brings something to light to you, and you don't act on it. You suppress the voice of God. You, you suppress your own conscience, the law of God written on your heart, working through your soul. You suppress that over and over and over again. That's a sin. And any sin, if you remain in it long enough, or for some sins immediately— it's going to open up the doorway to the demonic in your life. It can. I have had the worst demonic attack I've ever had since I got saved was because I was, I was not mm -hmm. obeying my conscience. I wasn't involved in sin. But I knew people around me, Christians, were involved in sin. And um, I needed to bring correction in that area. I had a responsibility from God to bring correction in that area. We're talking about like supernatural mm -hmm. spiritual sins, things that I, I couldn't sit right with in my own conscience. And because I allowed myself to be in fellowship and just kind of push that under the rug, I was getting attacked multiple times in one night. The attacks were lasting 10 minutes at a time. I was praying, rebuking, doing all the, saying all the right things, doing all the right things. And then I was like, okay, Lord, I know there must be an open door here. Show me where the door is open. Where is there an open door in my life? And immediately he brought to mind what, what it was. I needed to address some things with three different people. And I needed to close those doors. Because what they were involved in was allowed to pass on to me because God, God brought it to my mind and my conscience, and I wasn't responsible with the information I was giving, given from the Lord and that I had gathered from what I had witnessed, right? And him, to him mm -hmm. who knows much, much is expected, yeah. right? So if your conscience is telling you, hey, you know, I need to warn you, brother, that what you have in your bedroom right now, that that's new age and that that goes against God. And, you know, you playing with a Ouija board, I know you're a professing Christian, you think it's just a board game or Dungeons and Dragons or something. I know you think it's just a board game. And, you know, if your conscience starts telling you you need to rebuke him and do that, and you suppress it, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to You're going to grieve yeah. the spirit, firstly. You're going to sear your conscience, potentially, secondly. But I do believe in that instance where the, where the spirit tells you and your conscience tells you, rebuke them, give them correction, give them loving direction, and you say no, no, no then you can start inviting yeah. that into your life as well. I've, I've had it. I think yeah. we yeah. all agree that that's an instance. Now, I want to say one more thing, and then I'll turn it back over to you guys. The fact that there are gray areas that require a little bit more thought and a little bit more nuances proves that there's black and white areas. The only reason we can call an, an area gray is because we know there's clearly defined black areas and clearly defined white areas, and we're not sure how far on the gradient scale does it fall in terms of severity of sin. But the gray area doesn't prove that there's no black and white. It proves mm. that there's black and white. So people might be able to think of an instance where it's kind of cloudy. Will this spread oppression to other members of my household or not? But that doesn't mean that we can't say with 100% certainty that you bring them into your midst. You bind them, you putting them on your bookshelf, you put them in your garden, you hang them on your wall, you wearing them on a necklace, you having them on a tapestry, you having them on artwork on your, your, hall, your, on your wall, Anything that re represents false spirituality, pagan spirituality, which is demonic spirituality, 
it doesn't mean we can't say with certainty that you're going to invite demons into your life under those instances, just because we don't know if that will pass on to your daughter who's a believer or unbeliever before or after conviction comes. It doesn't mean that there's not black and white areas, and these black and white areas are clearly defined Old Testament, New Testament, and are always linked to um, demonic involvement as a consequence. Yeah. And it can, um, first of all, if it represents a false spiritual system, we should expect yeah. it to grieve the spirit, grieve the spirit's presence in our in our house. We want our house to be a temple unto the Lord, right? And we want our body to be a temple unto the Lord. And just like, you know, the Bible tells us very clearly how to handle our body as a living sacrifice unto God, you know, our houses mm-hmm. should be temples. I want it to be a temple unto the Lord. I want to, I want it to facilitate the manifest presence mm-hmm. of God. And I don't, I don't want some demon God in Quetzalcoatl on a, Maya, on a Mayan calendar and some other flying serpent deity on my culture, or sorry, on my wall, because it's part of some culture I think that's cool and historical. I don't want to grieve the Spirit of God. I think it can weaken our faith as well. Because the Spirit is the one who empowers the Christian worldview in us, yeah. right? Nobody says Jesus is Lord but by the Holy, Holy Spirit. The ministry of the Spirit is the only reason you and I are believers. The only reason anybody is a believer is because the Holy Spirit lives in us and is a, a self-authenticating, self-verifying witness to Christ, to the person and work of Christ. And we have that inner witness of the Holy Spirit, and I don't want to grieve the Spirit because I'm not going to be able to discern good from evil. I'm not going to be able to discern the spiritual things of God because they're revealed to our spirit by the spirit. First Corinthians, uh, First Corinthians chapter two is a big verse on that. When Paul talks about the natural man versus the spiritual man, the things of the spirit are revealed to our spirit by God. So if I'm grieving the spirit in my life, naturally, will that weaken my faith and my confidence in Christ? Yeah. yeah. Especially when we read in verses like in first and second John, where it says, and this is how we know we are children of God, by the Spirit that He's given to us. The Spirit is meant to act as assurance yeah. as well, not just the one who testifies to Christ and strengthens us in our um, Christian walk and the Christian worldview. He's the one that gives us assurance that we're children of God, right? As many as received the Spirit of God, He gave right to be called the children of God. Or as many as many believe on His name, so I was thinking about another verse about the Spirit. The Spirit uh, bears the Spirit witness that we are children of God. That's another version of Yeah. Right. So basically, I don't want to. I don't want to sear my conscience. I don't want to disturb my conscience. Um, that there's consequences for that spiritually. I don't want to grieve the spirit. There's lots of spiritual consequences for that. And like you said, I don't want to be dipping into old yeah. memory streams as well that are provoking feelings of nostalgia, flashbacks, old yeah. memories. Right. And psychology, there's a phenomenon known as neuroplasticity, where through conditioning, being exposed to the same stimuli over and over and over again. Let me use an object here. Okay, here's a pair of glasses. Um, I hate wearing them. I want to get my eyes fixed. But the point is, so let's say these glasses, let's say this was actually a tool of sorcery sorcery or idolatry, and that I used this pair of glasses 200 times when I was at the New Age movement to try to invoke, I don't know, some spiritual power in the universe, or to clean my chakras, or to contact extraterrestrials, from the Pleiadian constellation or something like that. Now, if I have this in my midst after I come to Christ, Mm. what's going to happen when my brain is used to producing a certain response immediately after seeing this? It's going to snap back. My my neural firings, my brain, it's going to engage in that way, preparing to respond neurochemically to what this object has been used for over and over and over again. So, like Mariah said, if you have something in your life, even from an ex-partner of yours, it can create an emotional attachment there because your brain associates that with a certain outcome. And your brain kind of gets molded around that outcome through conditioning time after time after time again. You see this, you associate with an outcome over and over again. And so people come out of the New Age movement and their house is still decked out with Mm -hmm. the crystals they used and the tapestries that they used to hang up and the clothing they used to wear. And I'm saying that that's going to be dangerous for you from a purely psychological perspective even, where your brain is not designed to look at these things that for years and years and years were associated with a certain outcome, and all of a sudden you're going to see it now in your living environment and produce a totally different response. That's not how God has designed the brain, right? You need to get these things out of your living environment so they're not feeding old memory streams, giving yourself, you know, an ability to be tempted. When it comes to Christianity, 
Paul says, I count everything in my life prior to Christ as Mm. loss. Why? To gain Christ. Right? So on the other side of self-denial is intimacy with a person. And in intimacy with a person is everything. That's what we're built for. We're built for fellowship with God. And so I know every time God is telling me to do something, to give something up, to lay something down, I'm going to get more of his presence, more of his power, more fellowship with him, more of an anointing in my daily life for ministry or to lead my family or to carry out his will in the world. I'm gaining Christ. I'm gaining a person, right? I'm not doing it for nothing. And so self-denial, when I started to realize, like, that's really Satan's primary deception is that obedience won't bring you happiness, won't bring you joy. But it does because obedience leads you into the presence of God. And everything we're looking for is in the presence of God, right? Times of refreshment come from the presence of the Lord, Acts 3. In the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. So immediately when I started to make these decisions, and they were hard and I would fight tooth and nail for some of them. But immediately, as soon as I made it, bam, the presence of the Lord would rush in. And I'd sense his presence. I'd be like, oh my gosh, this is what I was missing out on. That's nothing. I'm going to, you know, quickly do everything I know I'm going to have to do eventually. Right? Everything that we know we're going to have to do, yeah. like, do it now. Otherwise, it's just going to continue compiling, causing stress, anxiety. Um, it's going to weaken the presence of God in your life, the Spirit of God in your life. Silence his voice over and over gradually. Just get it over with now and trust there's going to be blessing favor more of his presence on the other side of that now when it came to like destroying Mm -hmm. artwork and stuff it kind of yeah it was kind of tough because you know some of these artworks you know were worth thousands of dollars and i couldn't sell them because i didn't want to redistribute them back Mm -hmm. into satan's kingdom so that he can use them as ammunition to destroy someone else's life and i didn't want to you know paint over them because I didn't think that's right, knowing that underneath that coat of paint is occult yeah. symbolism. And so I was like, I'm just going to trash it and count it as loss. But you don't count it as loss for nothing. You count it as a loss to gain Christ. right? And, and when you do these things, you're ministering unto the heart of the Lord. And that, that's your primary ministry, is unto the Lord. Do everything as unto the Lord. right? Unto the glory of God, in the name of Jesus. And you have to understand, too... Even if you're purely selfishly motivated in these decisions, which as a Christian you shouldn't be, but even if you're only self-interested, you need to keep in mind the Lord has rewards yeah. stored up in the in heaven for those who love Him and obey Him. Why does Jesus say, "Store up treasure for yourself in heaven, not on earth where you know moth and dust corrupt, yeah. but in heaven"? Right? We want to be rich toward God. So, what is the inheritance that He's kept in store for me? Right? If I'm giving this up, does that increase? my inheritance and glory does jesus not say i'll reap a hundredfold on houses i give up thank you so much for joining us on calvary conversations if you haven't already please make sure to like subscribe and share this video if you like to listen to us wherever you get your podcast just type in calvary conversations you can also follow us on instagram at calvary conversations thank you so much to our sponsors mission heating and cooling please check out their website in the description below you can also support calvary conversations a one-time gift or a monthly gift down in the description below. Thanks so much guys and God bless.